Hi, right, this time round we're going to take a look at the Super Graphics from NEC. This console was born really to fight off Nintendo's Super Nintendo console. Um, it was a mid sort of generation hardware refresh, the fourth generation. NEC decided to upgrade their PC engine with a second graphics chip and additional RAM, allowing the console to display effects including a secondary background and more sprites on the screen. The Super Graphics console was sold in Japan only and only had five games taking advantage of the so called Super Graphics upgrade. It was also compatible with the CD ROM ROM upgrades, that were, but none of the games ever took advantage of this extra feature. Its killer app title was Ghouls and Ghosts, and this pretty much wiped the floor with all the other different remakes of that game. This was probably the definitive version. Um, it came predominantly on Hue cards. The system had obviously uh, an extra video processor and a lot of upgrades. Um, it had a 32 kilobytes of main memory and 128 kilobytes of video memory. Sold about 75,000 units and was released in 1989 for about £350-ish, comparable in today's money. As with most of my videos, um, it's time to take this apart. These consoles are getting old now. It's time to take it apart and have a look at the you know, the capacitors and the condition of the boards. Um, these have a reputation for cracking boards, so we need to take a look at that to make sure everything is all okay. First things first, obviously just get it all to bits, and it's a game bit driver, um, you know, similar to the Nintendo style game bit driver. Get the RF shield on, and it's, you're greeted with a massive, massive board. When you compare it to the PC Engine, you know, its predecessor, um, this is gigantic. Uh, they really spread everything around. I think it was in an effort to make it feel more premium, um, but basically I think it all probably could have fitted in the similar form factor as the original PC Engine when you actually look inside. Mine's in actually pretty good condition. There's a, you know, a lot of flux around and a bit of dust and that, but actually I'm very, very pleased. There's no capacitor leakage. The board's in really good condition. There's no cracks. So I've been really, really lucky in this. This isn't a console that obviously you play very often, but I really did want to revisit this just to make sure that, you know, if there's anything I could do for the console to make it last a bit longer. These machines obviously are quite rare now. They're getting quite expensive. So it's obviously always good Good to keep an eye on your collection to make sure everything's going to last the test of time. So looking around the board, it only really becomes necessary to do a cap change. Um, even that doesn't really look necessary. There are no leaks on any of the caps. They all look in fantastic condition. But you're stuck with this dilemma of do you continue or do you leave it alone? You know, do you leave it alone? Do you continue recapping it? I'd made the decision. I bought the caps. So I think it's... In this instance, they look pretty easy to do. There are some machines that you look at it and you go, am I going to do more damage? So the, you know, I think you do have to evaluate at this time. I think that one of the biggest consoles is the laser active. The sheer weight of work that's necessary to, to, to replace the caps and stuff like that. Um, when I've looked through my machines, I only replace the capacitors that are necessary or the ones that, he, you know, that are usually go. Usually around the power supplies and stuff like that where there's a lot of heat generated, you'll usually find that that's you know, a factor that causes the caps to dry out or the actual seals to start leaking. So we're going to change these caps for some nice high quality ones. Again, I, there's nothing there to, to say any evidence that there was a problem, but while we're here, I think it's better that we go in and get all these things changed for some nice new caps. While I'm busy working away changing those capacitors, we'll take a look at some of the specs of the machine. So the processor was a Hudson Soft HUC 620A and a 6502 based 8 bit CPU running at 3.58 MHz or 7.16 MHz. Like I said earlier, the RAM is 32 kilobytes of in main memory and 128 kilobytes of video memory. Uh, the graphics were produced by Hudson Soft HUC 6270A, which was the visual display processor, and that could pump out resolutions of 512 by 242. Um, that's pretty much typical, you know, of what it what it was could could uh, display. 482 colours from a palette of 512 and 128 sprites on screen which is obviously pretty much double what the original PC engine could do. The audio was a, a six channel uh, PSG, um, the format was predominantly Hue card uh, with up to 20 megabit of uh, um, storage on those cards. You could have an optional CD-ROM add-on 
Um, but as, like I say, none of the games um, supported that. They're only the supported games were only Hue card games. So I'm going to do something a little bit different in this video. I'm going to give different things ratings. So the design of the console, I'm going to say that it's a very industrial-looking console. Um, contra to you know the smallness of the PC engine and the way that it used, you know, all the other consoles have been. Um, this is obviously a massive console in comparison. So. I'm going to give the, the design of it 8 out of 10. Um, durability, so you know the, the construction of the console, I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10 because I think you know coming from NEC, it's you know it's pretty much bulletproof. It looks you know really really good. It's uh, absolutely fantastic. You know and everything it looks quite robust. Nothing. I don't think it's going to pretty much die anytime soon. Um, so controllers, um, being from NEC line, they're obviously really small uh, for Westerners and. Um, I find them a little bit small and they, you do get fatigue from them, but yeah, they're well built, so I'm going to give them a 7 out of 10. Uh, the graphics for the for the super graphics, um, even though the, the, the library is minute, there, you could see some of the changes that made a difference to each game, especially in Go you know, Ghosts and Goblins. Um, they look stunning, you know, in comparison, but it's a shame that this machine never really got going, so even though it's a console that doesn't really do any good. I think the graphics compared to other things at the time, I'm going to give that, say, an 8 out of 10. Um, we're going to look at audio. So, looking at the audio side, you know, it's not fantastic, but it's certainly okay. Um, I think it's it's good for the era, so I'm going to give that a 7 out of 10. Um, the media that the games come on. Now, Hue cards, to me, always seemed a bit weird um, but they're small and compact and they, they're nice but they were very very expensive um, you know some of the hue cards could go for up to 100 pounds because of obviously the size needed so I'm going to give that about a 7 out of 10 um, the games library on the super graphics um, there are only five native games for it um, which was a which was a major problem um, but the super graphics had the access to the entire PC engine library um, which was obviously quite varied in that era um, and catapults it into a into a quite a high level really so the, the super graphics on its own right I'd only probably give it a 2 out of 10 um, considering it can run obviously all of the previous generation you know the, you know, the PC engine library um, that would elevate it to a 7 or 8 because obviously it's got all that massive um, back catalogue um, value for money um, it's going to be fairly low because obviously you never really got any games for it so I'd probably give that a 4 out of 10 next would be you know from a collector's point of view um, I think that's really they are really collectible it's a it's a very unusual unique looking console there's not that many ever been produced so the rarity is quite there so yes they're, they're getting expensive but from a collector's point of view they're great to look at um, they work really well still. There's nothing really major to go wrong with them in the future. So from a perspective collector's point of view, um, I think I'd give that a 9 out of 10. So uh, I'm just going to run through a few games now, leave you to run out with this. And if you got it this far, thanks for watching. And I'll catch you again in the next video. Bye for now.